One major problem that has plagued this current administration will be the high level of insecurity that has gained momentum under its watch, as banditry and kidnappings have become the order of the day. Innocent citizens have lost loved ones to terrorists or are made to pay heavy ransoms to secure their release in most cases. The high level of abductions across the country by terrorists is almost bringing the country to its knees, begging for divine intervention. With the 2023 general election around the corner, the high level of insecurity might threaten the electoral process if it is not tackled aggressively. Joining us on this show this morning as we discuss the insecurity in Nigeria and what the government is doing about it as we gradually approach the 2023 general elections is General Loki Irabo, Nigeria's Chief of Defense Staff. Welcome to the uh, morning show, uh, General Irabo. Thank you very much for honoring our invitation. Good morning, General. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Abati and the deep team. Thank you for I'm joining glad to be here. Us. Thank you. Uh, let's start with this. The rising spate of insecurity all over the country continues to remain a source of major concern for all Nigerians. Why is it that the military establishment, which you had, has not been able to put a lead on rising violence and criminality in the country? Well, um, thank you for, for the question. Um, let, let me say that the military is not alone in redressing all issues of insecurity in the country. And to also say that um, it would be inappropriate to say that the military has not been able to put a lead to the issues of insecurity in Nigeria. This is because quite a lot has happened Perhaps if the military and of course other security agencies who are responsible for redressing these issues, if they've not undertaken the kind of actions they've done in the past, perhaps the situation would have been worse than what it is. But of course, um, the fact that there are still incidents of um, insecurity across the country means that there's quite a lot of work to be done. And that's what we are committed to, to, to doing. So I'd like to assure you, and of course, by extension, all Nigerians, that we are leaving no stone unturned to redress the security imbalance across the country. Yeah. Now, from the intelligence at your disposal, would you say that Boko Haram and Iswap terrorists operating in the Northeast have some links to bandits in the Northwest? Well, thank you to do, um, you know, severally we have had to um, acknowledge the fact that um, based on the very serious work we're doing in the Northeast, having, you know, um, sent, you know, I mean, dealt a, a huge blow on the ISWAP Boko Haram terrorists in the Northeast. Many of them have now, are now relocating to find you know, safer havens. Uh, in this case, um, they found you know, some places in the Northwest um, to, to link up with other elements or other criminal elements in that, in that part of the country. So this is what we have acknowledged in the past. But again, we haven't observed that. We have also you know, heightened our operational engagement. I'm sure you know that um, in the Northwest, we have Operation Harder in Daji. And the North Central, we call it have, uh, you know, Operation White Punch, Operation Thunder Strike, and Operation White Stroke to be able to redress all issues of insecurity in these parts of the country. So um, yes, of course, there are linkages. And you must also not uh, discount the fact that um, the northwestern part of Nigeria, you know, is where we have, you know, boundaries with, uh, with Niger. And, and then, of course, I believe that you are aware of um, the issues that is, you know, happening with uh, the Islamic state in West, Af in West African province, especially for the greater Sahel, Sahel region, uh, which uh, by extension, um, you know, draws some form of, um, you know, in or if you like, interaction 
with uh, the global, or if you like, you know, the larger um, ISWAP uh, element. So it's not impossible that uh, you know the incursions uh, could be. I mean, also from you know that those our northern borders. So the aggregate of all this is what, of course, you're finding um, happening in the northwest. But of course, I'd like to assure you once again that um, we are taking every measure to ensure that the, the menace does not uh, go beyond what it is currently. Right. Uh, th this government continues to tell a lot of people out there and all of us in the country that the program has been largely degraded and no longer occupies any territory in the northeast. However, we continue to get reports of the terrorist group still controlling large swaths of land in states like Borono, which have even become no-go areas for the military. You know, what's your take on this? What's happening? Well, R Rufa, I, 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 do not, I do not want to agree that that's what the government says. It's not what the government says, but what it is. The reality is that uh, the northeast you know, region, especially Brodo State, you know, it's, um, a, a lot has changed. In fact, life is almost normal in, in Brodo State. That I can tell you. So it's not a claim. It is what exists. I believe that you have correspondence in Meduguri. Perhaps you may want to you know, have a check back on them. So there is no control of any, any part of uh, Borono State at all, that I can tell you. But of course, the, those criminal elements are not completely out of uh, circulation. And that's why we still have you know, large presence of military in, in those areas. But what we you know, are doing is to ensure that the, the, the last, last mile issues connected to it are redressed. And then also bringing in and scaling up uh, the presence of not just the police, but of course Nigerian Security and Civil Defense Corps, for them to gradually begin to take uh, you know, um, you know, the center stage in terms of um, normal security provisioning um, you know, in the light of the successes we've uh, recorded. So um, please be assured uh, that it's not just a claim by government, that is the reality on ground. And I'm glad that the Borno State Governor himself, you know, recently, you know, you know, told um, Nigerians how, you know, things have largely improved in, in Borno State. So uh, you may also want to get a fact check from him uh, since, you know, the, um, the, the, you know, security of the state itself, first and foremost, he lies right in his hands. But I can tell you that the support he has given to us and the support and, of course, the uh, the larger uh, Borno citizens is what we're leveraging to, to, to build upon and ensuring that uh, no part of the state or no outer of insecurity uh, continues to, to, to take place. Well, General, can you give us an update on the attempt by the military to rescue the Abuja Kaduna train victims, as well as uh, other victims that are still being held in captivity by the ab abductors. And is it really true that these victims are used as human shields, making it difficult for the military to rescue them? Well, uh, Mr. Barty, I like to appeal that I refrain from indicating what we're doing with respect to the Abuja Kaduna train incident victims. What is clear, and I, which I need to reassure Nigerians, is that quite a lot is happening. I'm sure, you know, um, two weeks ago, the release of the 11, you know, victims should tell Nigerians that quite a lot is happening, that government is doing quite a lot. Um, I wouldn't, you know, say that um, they are using anybody as human shield. A human shield or no human shield, we will continue to conduct our operations. But beyond you know, the military line of operation, you equally know there are other non-kinetic lines of operation which um, you know, um, is part of the entire you know, um, security architecture in redressing all the issues um, with respect to these uh, abductions and other, uh, you know, incidents of, uh, of, of criminality across the country. 
So why looking up to the military? Yes, of course, we are in the lead, but of course, there are other elements that are involved in the entire uh, process. So um, I, I, I like to assure Nigerians that very soon, all those who are held captives will regain their freedom. And of course, those criminal elements behind these this, you know, criminal acts will, will certainly be brought to justice. Is the military involved in attempts to apprehend the perpetrators of the attack on St. Francis Xavier Catholic Church in our Ocean State? If yes, can you please update us on the efforts to apprehend the perpetrators of that horrendous attack? Well, to do, I, I'm glad you said, you know, efforts are on. Yes, we are part and parcel of the overall architecture to, you know, bring to, to justice those who are behind the war incident. But if, if you allow me, uh, I'd like to again appeal that because it's an ongoing operation that would not, um, you know, you excuse me from giving further details on it. I think what we need to focus on is the fact that um, there are very potent actions that are being undertaken and that those who are behind that criminal act will be brought to justice and equally that peace and security will return to every part of the country. So let's be more positive, let's be more concerned about what is being done to, um, you know, to, to bring peace and security and to enable every Nigerian to go about their normal duties rather than focusing on you know, people who want to um, make us believe that we are unsafe, uh, which of course remains the entire goal of any criminal element, especially for terrorist uh, gangs. So I'm more focused on the positives rather than you know, issues that um, tend to drag us uh, and maybe an obstruction to, to, to our work processes. Okay. Uh Sidious, you said that the military has done a lot in Borono and they've cleared most areas. But I'd like you to react to a story in Vanguard of the 12th of January 2022, where Governor Zulum mentioned the fact that Boko Haram is still in control of two Borono LGAs. And if you read that story further, he says there are some highways like Dambua, the likes, and Southern Borono, where Boko Haram is collecting taxes. Uh, from people. I'd like you to react to that story. And I also want you to tell us, you know, what the military has been doing as regards technology deployment to fight crimes and all of that. And really, can you, you know, sincerely assure us that our military personnel are adequately equipped, well taken care of, well remunerated, you know, to address all the security challenges? Because we always hear about issues of welfare and the likes. Well, Thank you, uh, Rufai. I'm glad that you, the reference you made, you know, of the newspaper publication was that of January 12th. And uh, today is 29th of June. So that tells you, is, you know, well over five months uh, after that, um, you know, um, publication was made. And it might also interest you that um, you know, at the beginning of the year, I assured Nigerians as to what the military and other security agencies will be doing. Now, between that time and now, there have been massive deployment of equipment and material to the Northeast. That's why Northeast currently is silent. That's why the governor, you know, in his uh, recent uh, pronouncement, made mention of you know, peace that has largely returned to the state. And in his words, that he, in fact, over, I mean, he sleeps, uh, you know, with his, with his uh, eyes closed 85% of the time. And I think that's the, the expression that he, he made. And he's quite, he's quite vocal about that. And not just him, but, you know, I've had calls from where meaning you know, citizens of Brno who, of course, have uh, commended the military for what they have done. But of course, I'm not, I'm not saying that it's only the military that have made this contribution, but we largely have contributed to the state of peace in Brno currently. So it's not, it's not um, to say that in the past, we have not had issues, we have had issues, but I'm talking about today, currently, what exists and what obtains in, uh, in, in Brno state. 
Now, additionally, excuse me. Additionally, I need to also, um, you know, mention that um, when I mention the issue of uh, massive deployment of, um, of of equipment, I'm also talking about, you know, uh, uh, things that have to do with technology. Those equipment are not just um, are not just, uh, you know. It, you know, what I call mundane equipment. No, I'm also dealing, we're also dealing with modern equipment. So the aggregate of the use of all this have led us to um, what we've done. Now, talking about, you know, uh, whether the military is adequately equipped. Now, adequate, perhaps, uh, is relative. And, uh, and if, if we're not adequately equipped, then, of course, we wouldn't have made the uh, results in the notice. But is this sufficient? So it is not. It, that's the reason why Mr. President, you know, you know, and I must, I must, you know, use this opportunity to, to thank him for the support he has given to us. It's quite massive. I must, I must, I must admit, and I must also keep letting Nigerians that within the limits of the resources available to government, we have had a very fair share of allocations to equip and train to redress the security situation across the country. But we'll keep get, we need to get more. Why? Because threat is transforming. I believe that Nigeria is not in, you know, an ally to itself. You also know what is happening across the, the, the globe. So um, in the light of all these developments, and if you also look at even you know, the technology, you know, deployment of technology which you talked on. It doesn't come cheap. So it's in the light of that, that, you know, our demands will always continue, not only to increase, but of, of course continue to be there. Why? Because these are essential to be able to keep, you know, the security situation to, a, you know, um, a, a state where everyone, we assume that there's insecurity in the country. I mean, I mean, where everyone will assume that there is no insecurity, there is, there's no problem of, there's no threat of insecurity in the country. So I'm urging the press to also join in this fight to bring, not just bring consciousness to Nigerians, but equally to, um, to sensitize, um, you know, um, the populace, for them to know that they have a part to play, and for the press also to take the fight to, to, to the criminal element. You must, you know, find a way to, you know, expose, you know, their criminality. Not necessarily that, um, you know, you will not, you not focus on what government and government security agencies are doing, but it must be, it must be put in the right context to know that we live in the same environment and we are all victims together if we do not act. So for me, uh, that's the way to go. And I, I believe that um, um, Arise you know, Television um, is doing well, but I, I need you to please join along with uh, the rest of your colleagues to, to, to uh, focus attention on what will keep us on the positive track rather than the negativities. Okay, General, despite everything you have said, we have seen several videos of soldiers especially those that have been deployed uh, in theaters of war, complaining that they have been abandoned by the military establishment, that they are ill-equipped, and that their allowances are not paid as I went due. Why do such videos continue to emerge? Well, if there are videos of that nature, I want to believe that certainly they are not within the last two years. They were not made within the last two years. That I can confidently tell you, and did I beat my chest to tell you, that soldiers or members of the armed forces today will not say that their allowances are not being paid. That, cannot, that cannot be correct. That certainly cannot be granted. I need you to take me on it. So if there is anyone in the armed forces today who says their allowances are that they are deployed operation and they are in the rear areas or they are engaged in one, one task or the other and the allowances are not being paid, I would, like, I would like you to take me on it. But then we live in a world where social media has become, you know, uh, almost a government of itself. So 
Um, anybody can regurgitate, um, you know, past videos. Some others can also, you know, create videos and claim that these are, uh, you know, men and, and women of the armed forces. But I do not, I do not focus on, on those inanities. I, I'm more focused on the job ahead. And I want to use the opportunity to also appreciate, you know, the service chiefs who have been, you know, quite up to the task. I mean, wonderful team that I have um, dealing with the nuances of operations and logistics administration of, of the armed forces. They've done incredibly well. Uh, but again, um, uh, and from the larger society point of view, uh, because um, these things are still ongoing, they are not over yet, um, so it might not be, um, you know, um, too appropriate to now say, okay, um, all, all, all is well. But I like to tell you that our, our eyes are fixed on the ball. The goal is there and we are pursuing the goals. The mandate is clear, the mandate from you know, uh, the Commander-in-Chief is clear, and we are committed to meeting this mandate. In the Niger Delta, all theft and vandalism are taking a toll on the country's economy. What are the Nigerian Navy and the Joint Task Force doing to end this menace? Also, military personnel have been accused of colluding with criminal elements in the Niger Delta. How is this being addressed? Well, the Niger Delta issue, of course, the Navy, Operation Delta Safe, not just the Navy, but of course the Army, the Navy focuses more on, 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 on the larger body of waters, but of course you also find that there are estuaries and oil and gas installations, you find that upland areas, there are you know, um, a lot of installations that the Army has oversight. So a combination of the activities of members of the Armed Forces, and of course not also discounting the, the contribution of the Air Force who provide ISR and sometimes um, even helicopter bone operations uh, to be able to redress issues of insecurity within the Niger Delta. And the results are clear. The Navy within the last year and a half have been able to maintain a clean maritime environment, especially when you're talking about the shipping lanes, such that currently do not have any report of piracy and all the likes. But of course, there are problems that have to do with crude oil theft, you know, vandalism of, of, uh, of um, you know, uh, the pipelines and other associated issues, which we are dealing with in concert with other members of the defense and security agencies. So, uh, so far, so good, and um, even though uh, there's still, you know, a long haul, but then, um, you know, I must, I must say that quite a lot of improvement has, has been, been, been made. But I must also use this opportunity to say that, you know, the, the, the citizens of the Niger Delta or the inhabitants of the Niger Delta, uh, who we are also sensitizing for them to collaborate more with us, need to do greater you know, I mean, take greater responsibility because the environment that is being polluted by these criminals, it is those who inhabit these areas that will be worse for it. Even when the issue of oil and gas, I mean, the theft is, is, is uh, it's forgotten, the environment, the degradation in the environment alone is going to have its effect in the next 30, 50 years. So it is from that context that I would like to urge you know, every citizen of the Niger Delta or every inhabitant of the Niger Delta to collaborate more with the armed forces and members of the, of, of the security agencies for them to be able to put a stop to these uh, acts of criminality in the Niger Delta. Now, to do, you, you talked about the collusion or the alleged collusion of the of members of the armed forces in some of these criminal acts. Well, those are um, allegations. I, I do not also, you know, run away from the fact that, um, you know, there may be moves amongst us, and that is why we take we take action, disciplinary action against any act of indiscipline that we find. Um, a lot of our personnel have, um, have you, know, you know, faced court martial. Some have been sent to prison. Some also have been dismissed. 
But that is only, you know, um, a very small number compared to the establishment itself, the institution. So if there are one or two persons who have, you know, been involved in one form of criminality, the issue is, have they been caught? Have they been dealt with? Why use them to now, you know, have, you know, uh, um, you know assessment to, have, to, to make up the assessment for, you know, the larger armed forces? So um, for me, uh, that, that, that is not the reason why um, we, have, we have problems. We, we, I do not subscribe to it. And the armed forces that I, that I, that I lead is a professional armed forces. We have men and women that are patriotic, you know, doing the job that they were sent to do. And, I, and I'm proud of every one of them. And of course, for the ones that, um, you know, have, you know, soiled our name, we've, that's the reason why we have dealt with them in the manner that we've done. So going forward, I'd like to appeal to all Nigerians to please give information to members of the armed forces, give information to the police, give information to the security agencies, and for them, and they should also know that security remains everybody's business. Do not shy away from reporting anyone whose ways are not right. If you don't, then of course uh, you'll be the loser. But I, I know that as we continue to sensitize Nigerians, uh, greater cooperation will, 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 uh, will be achieved. Right, so beyond the Niger Delta, you know, some military personnel have also been accused <clears throat> of collaborating with bandits and Boko Haram terrorists to launch attacks on our armed forces, even you know, to provide them with military-grade arms and ammunition. Uh, have such personnel been brought to book? Can you say holistically they've been brought to book? And what are you doing to ensure that those terrorist groups do not infiltrate, indoctrinate, and compromise our military personnel? And I'll refer you to an interview we had with Sheikh Gumi uh, a while back where he talked about this strongly. And he said, you know, the army is split down the middle, you know, even across lines of religion, you know, we had words like that. And it talked about, you know, this infiltration. Well, what do you say to things like that? Well, um, first and foremost, Rufai, the armed forces remains a professional armed forces. We have procedures. We have protocols, both operational protocols, logistics protocols, and administrative protocols. Now, we do not take lightly issues of vetting, issues of ensuring that we have the right person with the right aptitude to be part and parcel of the armed forces. So there is a filtration process, there's a filtration mechanism that is already put in place so that when we recruit, you know, each of our recruits will pass through those, you know, what I may call crucible for the purpose of understanding. So those filtration processes are there. But of course, we also know that we live in the same environment where these criminals also live. These criminals, we, we, if and every one of us, we come from families, and some of these families are also the families where many of these criminal elements, where they come from. So, in the light of that, of course, you can't, you can't run away from the fact that there are some who, for one reason or another, may, you know, um, you know, go out, 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 out of line. And that is the reason why Every attempt they have made, we have brought, we have discovered them by virtue of our intelligence, both overt and covert, and also institutionalizing the court martial processes that have, you know, made us to send them to jail. So those who in the earlier, you know, in the earlier discussion that we had, that I referred to as modes, it is from that, you know, standpoint that, um, that, 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 they were, that they were dealt with sent to jail, dismissed from, 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 from the service. So it is not, we, we are not in any way going to um, be deterred by, you know, some of those um, um, reports that, um, you know, which you referred to. 
many of those reports too, you know, could be exaggerated. But again, for me and for uh, the leadership of the armed forces, one single case is bad enough, and that's why we take it very seriously. We're talking about reports, General. There have been reports also that have been released by human rights groups, such as Amnesty International, on rights abuses by the military, including extrajudicial killings, and even in some instances, rape, sexual abuse of women, and all of that. What is the military doing under your watch uh, to shake off these damning allegations against men of the armed forces? Well, Amnesty International, I, I, I want to believe uh, about you are referring to, you know, past reports. Uh, and, the recent, and the recent reports of Amnesty International, I, I, I'm, I'm not aware that there are reports of the like that you've just, uh, um, you know, mentioned. But, of course, you need to also know that um, this, this insecurity that we're facing, um, um, there, are many, there are many routes to it. There are many strands uh, to it. And, and Amnesty International um, does not uh, live here. Uh, I mean, when I say does not live here, it, it, the structure that they have are only made are only by virtue of individuals only by virtue of those who, um, in one way or the other, um, you know, build up their report from sometimes what they hear from people, other times what they feel that have happened. But beyond that, I, I want to assure you that the members of the armed forces, especially, we keep to the tenets of human rights uh, uh, limits. We, we, are, we are professional in form, we are professional in disposition. And so um, there are rules of engagement and we strictly abide by them. And then of course, within our, our you know, orbit, we have made provisions for human rights desk. So there are officers who on a daily basis, their responsibility is to ensure that troops keep to the rules of engagement, ensuring that the limits of the international humanitarian law is, 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 uh, is kept um, you know, as, as they conduct their operation. So, uh, so for me, I, I'm so proud of the armed forces that I lead, and I'd like to you know, tell uh, not just the press, but the rest of the world for them to know that if there were any issues of, of human rights violations in the past, certainly not as we have currently. Certainly not. It does not exist currently. And going forward, we'll keep refining the process. We'll keep refining you know, um, you know, our approach to, 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 to conduct of operations. And, and every Nigerian will be proud that they have the kind of armed forces that we have. Right, thank you, General. But I want to draw your attention to news that broke last night about communal clashes in Cross River State, a community called Inco, where uh, members of the armed forces are being accused of killing, raping, and burning down houses. I just want to bring that to your attention. You might want to comment on that specific allegation from last night and also ask another question about the fact that our government, the Nigerian government, has expanded considerable resources procuring super Tucano jets from the U.S. Are these planes now being used in combat missions, and how have they helped to suppress terrorist attacks? All right, thank you. The, the um, incident in Nko community in the Cross River, as well as Abubra. Um, yes, it was not yesterday. It was actually um, um, three days ago. I'm aware, and um, the troops were never involved in any issue of raping and destruction. No, that's not correct. Rather, and I'm glad that you, you, you readily mentioned it, that it was a communal clash. So what is the business of the military in being involved in communal clash? But of course, because lives were being lost, and we have military 
deployment around those areas. It was on the basis of that that the commanding officer of the unit went to go to redress the problem that he had. Now, getting to the scene, the communities, one of the communities, for whatever reason, because they were armed, they shot at the commanding officer, wounded him, and also wounded about five soldiers. And so, no officer will see his men being wounded when he has come to keep the peace. No soldier will stand idle and then see, you know, uh, citizens, you know, unleashing mayhem, not amongst themselves only, but equally taking up arms against those who have come to bring sanity to the environment. So it was at that point that he insisted that those who shot at the commanding officer and, and the soldiers should be, should be apprehended. In fact, let me tell you that in one of those communities, a former chief of naval staff, that's where he comes from. So would you think that the armed forces that he was a part of will now want to go and destroy his community? No. But you see, these are reports that are being peddled. Don't forget that there are two communities that were involved. Now, what is being peddled is that one community, I mean, that the military is, you know, um, destroying one community. It only tells you that perhaps some individuals who may not have been happy with intervention of the military may just come up with some form of falsehood and propaganda that uh, could, um, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, d dissuade the understanding of Nigerians about the matter. So, but what I need to assure you, and of course assure Nigerians, is that the military, you know, it's, it's apolitical, and we do, not, we do not take side. We are there to give support to the uh, civil authority, in this case the police, especially on this matter of, uh, of UNCO and Obobra. So, so this is, that's, that's, that's and I thought I needed to put that in, in context. Now, on, on the issue of Super Tucanos, yes, of course, I mean, we are grateful to the federal government for undertaking that huge investment. And the, the, those aircraft, those pieces of equipment have added to, you know, the, um, you know, the effort in redressing the insecurity that we have. And they've played their part, but of course, um, it should, it's not that what, because we have gotten Super Tucano, then all our problems are solved, no. Uh, there are so many things that we still require, but I must say that Super Tucanos have actually added in the redressing the problems that we have. And that's why, you know, you find, you know, um, that, um, you know, our operational gains are increasing on a daily basis. So as we build up our combat capability, then of course the, um, the, the you know, it, it aggregates to uh, operational effectiveness uh, in our operations. All right, so CDS, as uh, you talked about on call, as peace returned and is everything settled now in that area as regards uh, that situation that happened? And secondly, in your own opinion, do you think that a political solution can help douse the violence, you know, and the attacks allegedly being carried out, you know, by the Eastern Security Network and the so-called unknown gunmen in the Southeast, you know, and, and concerning that, which a lot of people also to make allegations against the military, you know, as regards, you know, killings of people in the South and extrajudicial killings and the likes and things like that. You know, Rufai, I'm glad that you asked that question. You know, since the beginning of mankind, political solution, or if you like, Military solution has never brought um, uh, total peace, if you like, uh, total resolution of a conflict. So for every conflict that the military have ever been involved, the military only lays the platform for other means of conflict resolution to be conducted. So in this case, of course, political solution lies at the root of the 
resolution of all crises. Whether it is Boko Haram, whether it is uh, IPOB, whether it is, uh, you know, all manner of agitations, there are things that, you know, that are, uh, almost all of them must end within, you know, the purview of political settlement. Why? Because when we're, dealing, when we're talking about political settlement, we're also looking at issues of governance. So in the local governments across the length and breadth of the nation, what is the level of development? How, what is the level of empowerment of the citizens? How have we been able to provide, you know, skills acquisition, you know, that we enable uh, citizens to not just be self-employed, but also be engaged in, in meaningful entrepreneurial, you know, issues. The federal government, of course, is doing quite a lot. I'm sure you know the programs of, of um, youth empowerment that uh, the federal government is doing. But, you know, let it, let it also, you know, deceive to the states and local governments. And not just, you know, having them in, in smaller numbers, in smaller packets, but then let it be an exponential, you know, growth of entrepreneurial, you know, uh, skills development and acquisition across, across uh, the length and breadth of the country. So that those who perhaps are uh, what you may uh, describe as idle hands will find something doing. And so when they find something doing, then of course uh, the, the, the pension, the propensity to engage in criminal uh, you know, enterprises will, will be reduced. Then, then the security agencies can now you know, be free to be able to you know, zero in on those who want to make criminal engagement their day-to-day um, you know, -day engagement. Then, you know, so, so for me, uh, this is the way to go, and I believe that, uh, yes, uh, whatever suggestions that anybody has that could, um, you know, uh, translate to political settlement of any crisis, of course, we will, I mean, uh, it, it would be a good thing to, to, to escalate it to the appropriate, uh, you know, quarters for, for it to be implemented. But then, that uh, there are political solutions does not mean that we, as members of the armed forces, we, we just, you know, fold our hands to say, okay, uh, a political solution could have solved this, so because it has not solved it, then we we'll, then we'll leave our nation to be born in. No, certainly not. That's why, on a daily basis, members of the armed forces, you find that they are empowered to join to support the police and ensure that uh, uh, our our land is not turned to um, you know to turn, turn, turn to a, a jungle where where law and order does not uh, do, do, does not find its way. So this is precisely informs you know um, our our engagement uh, to the form that you you now find across the statistics of the federation. So uh, going forward, I believe that um, and, uh, you know I listened to uh, about you when he was giving the primer for this interview, talking about uh, the elections that are coming. We believe, and I like to you know assure you and assure Nigerians that the election 2023 will be conducted under a secure atmosphere. That is a guarantee that I want to leave with, with, with you on this interview and for, of, for Nigerians. That certainly is what we are working very closely with. We've mapped out our plans along with the police and other security agencies, and we're you know, uh, escalating all our operational engagements to ensuring that will provide security guarantees that will enable INEC and, of course, all those uh, the stakeholders who are engaged in that uh, exercise, which is a national exercise that the whole world is, is looking up to Nigeria for, that it will be conducted you know, uh, under, under a, secured, a secured environment. That, that is a guarantee, and we are working very assiduously to ensuring that. Well, thank you, General. I guess that will be all. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you.